Hello, I'm Dr. Alejandro Bryce, and today I'm talking with Dr. Brenda Gorman from Elmhurst uh, College, and we're talking about the issue of, of bilingualism, uh, bilingual speech language pathology, and our, our first topic is looking at late talkers and mm -hmm. bilingual children. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on that issue for us. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions from clinicians and parents uh, wondering about their children who have been called late talkers and wondering if the fact that they are being raised in a bilingual environment might account for that late talking. Uh, so first, what do I mean by late talking? Um, we know that children typically meet developmental milestones at, at fairly regular predictable ages. So by 12 months of age, we're expecting that children are producing their first words. By 18 months of age, children should certainly be producing words, if not some simple word combinations. And they should be, at this age even, by 18 months, be relying to uh, relying on their words more than gestures to communicate. And then by two years of age, so 24 months, uh, children really typically have between 200 and 300 words, which sounds like a tremendous, a tremendous number, right, for young children. Uh, by late talkers, we, we're talking about children who are age two, 24 months, and they have uh, in the ballpark of 50 words or fewer. Okay. And so they're called late talkers. And uh, again, I've heard from many parents, many clinicians who wonder if um, the fact that kids are bilingual, if that might explain why, why their child is, is uh, considered a late talker. Uh, it's a very common question, and, and what the research says is, is very simply that no, that the bilingualism is not a cause of late talking. Uh, I think it's very much a, a visibility issue. Uh, many parents haven't heard about late talkers, right? It's, it's very much a, an SLP uh, term, terminology, late talkers. So, also, pediatricians may not know about late talking children, mm -hmm. and we know that sometimes they give the ill advice of mm -hmm. wait and see. Absolutely. That's very true, too. And that might be even more true in the case of children who are bilingual, that they might just need a little bit more time. Uh, but again, going back to what the research says, um, some research by Pearson, Fernandez, and Aller have found that really children meet those developmental milestones at similar ages, whether they're monolingual or bilingual. So again, no evidence there that the bilingualism slows kids down. Uh, a report by the Center for Applied Linguistics has, has also uh, confirmed that as well, that the bilingualism doesn't slow kids down, that really they meet those developmental milestones at uh, pretty much the same ages as monolinguals. Uh, so why do we get this question? I think, again, it, it's very much a visibility question that most people are not familiar with late talkers. It's not very visible, if, uh, so to speak. But bilingualism is very visible. In the U.S., it's, it's just not as common as, as bilingualism is in many other parts of the world. So it's very easy to latch on to, oh, that maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the bilingualism. Um, but if we think about it, uh, actually a lar relatively large percentage of children are late talkers, 10 to 15 percent, which probably surprises a lot of, uh, a lot of parents, right? So, and if we think about national statistics, about one out of five children come from homes where a language other than English is spoken. So if we're looking at one in 10 or one in seven kids are late talkers, and then we're adding the other piece on that 20% uh, of, of kids are from homes where another language is spoken, that really there, there will be a lot of children who are raised in bilingual environments who also happen to be late talkers. But, but that doesn't mean that they're related. It doesn't mean that bilingualism is the cause. So parents should look at the developmental issue mm -hmm. first of the, the fact that their child may not be talking mm -hmm. and hit those developmental milestones of, of saying words at, at approximately 12 months of age, mm -hmm. of, of having about 50 words at 18 months of age, and mm -hmm. then this tremendous vocabulary jump uh, to Absolutely. 200 words, yeah. 250 words at 24 months of age. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to those parents in terms of uh, my grandson's uh, mm -hmm. uh, late language abilities? 
Uh, rich language input. So whereas some clinicians might be inclined to take one language away so that they can better boost the other language, it's, it's no longer an issue of quantity, it's really an issue of quality. So rather than remove a language, I would highly recommend to, to continue and, and as much as possible to continue to provide very rich language experiences in both languages and, and to con continue to monitor and of course to uh, seek services if, if they do believe that the child is late developing. So, but that's a key point because particularly with bilingual kids, if uh, parents are told or if they think that they should wait to give them more time, um, it's, it's actually kind of missing that golden opportunity to provide the assistance. Right. The earlier the better. Early intervention right? assistance, exactly. earlier is better. Yes, and so even with monolingual English speaking children, we know that those late talkers, uh, it's it's hard for us to predict which of those kids are gonna something's gonna kick in and and all of a sudden they're just gonna pick it up and and um, develop language more normally versus those kids who will continue to have difficulties and it's difficult because of those late talkers it's it's almost fifty fifty whereas you know, half of the late talkers will go on to develop relatively normally, although some research by Leslie Rascorla, for example, who's followed those kids many, many years later, does still find, whereas they might perform with an average range um, in many areas of language and literacy. Some residuals. Exactly, yes, yeah, so that they're not uh, entirely on par with their peers who did develop and meet language milestones on time. Uh, but then half of those kids do go on to, to um, later receive the diagnosis of language impairment. So again, the earlier the better. And so it is important for parents and pediatricians and other professionals, again, to give the right advice, that it's, it's not the bilingualism, to seek services uh, as soon as they, they do feel that there is a problem. It's, it's almost ingrained in us to, to attribute difficulties to bilingualism, whether it be language, certainly the academic difficulties, uh, I know I've uh, taught fluency for a number of years, and even with my own son, who uh, he's a simultaneous bilingual and um, a little over the age of two, he did start uh, exhibiting um, disfluencies that I was concerned about. And, and even me, someone who's researched uh, at extensively bilingualism and the impact that it does and does not have on areas but but I think because we've been given this message so many times that oh maybe it's the bilingualism I remember sitting on the floor playing with him thinking oh boy maybe I should reduce to one language Brenda what am I saying I know better and and I did know better and sure enough you know then it occurred to me well I'm just gonna do what I tell parents to do slow their speech provide more pauses, which I did, and the disfluencies were not related to, to the bilingualism. So you heard that, folks. If, it's <laughs> yeah. if the child is bilingual, it's not necessarily the bilingualism. Yes, exactly. The old adage, if you yeah. hear hoofs pounding and coming mm -hmm. towards you, it may not be horses, maybe mm -hmm. it's zebras. Excellent, yeah. So we really need to, we need, really need to get at the root cause of, of issues because it's very unlikely that it is the bilingualism. So again, rich language input, mm -hmm. builds, uh, taking it away actually logically from an SLP point of view doesn't make sense. We don't take away language, we, we right. build. Right, don't take away that language. rich environment and exactly. environmental input from the parents. Yes. Interaction. Mm -hmm. You don't diminish a, a rich environment, uh, rich input. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That it was great. Sure, my pleasure.